Speaksies. This is Steve with Origin of Speaksies. In Richmond, Virginia, we have so many great craft beers that, just like your children, it's tough to choose the one you love best. But let's be honest, just like your kids, you know that you have a favorite. And my favorite Richmond craft beer is Hardywood. My favorite Hardywood craft beer is The Great Return, an American IPA with 7.5% ABV and whose proceeds also benefit our environment through the James River Association, which you know means a lot to me, hashtag green. To order Great Return or another great beer from Hardywood Brewery, go to hardywood.com. That's hardywood.com. Hardywood, Richmond's best craft beer, just like your favorite kid. Welcome to Origin of Speaksies. This is Scott's good friend, Steve. Scott is out this week. His beard is having its annual inspection, so that takes a few days. So I am running the show solo this week. Accordingly, I thought this would be a great time to look back at some of our older episodes to highlight some origins that you might have missed. So if you've listened to the show before, you know that I am both a word and animal enthusiast. I will begin with the three animals we all clearly agree are the best. Number one, cows. Milk, cheese, hamburger, steaks. Cows are awesome. Number two, pigs. Just for bacon. I could go on and on about these guys, but do I really need to say anything else? Bacon. And of course, number three, chickens. Basically because of Chick-fil-A. Even though I love these animals, there's one group of animals in particular that is high interest of me. Not necessarily in the best way. Bears. My daughter says that I have a phobia of bears. I've corrected her, as apparently she believed the word phobia meant healthy respect. I first discussed my healthy respect to bears way back in the third episode of Origin of Species. In this episode, Scott and I discussed two idioms, elephant in the room and loaded for bear. You might notice a little bit of a different sound quality. This episode was recorded in Scott's closet with the two of us huddled around a singular blue yeti. But most importantly, you can learn where my healthy respect of bears originated. Here's some highlights from episode three, Elephant in the Room and Loaded for Bear. solid two months where nobody comes and and I have to call the or I have to I have to email the county and make a complaint. Right. Um all right, so I think it's time to address the elephant in the room, which is the topic for okay. tonight. The wasn't, elephant wasn't sure where you're going with that. I'm trying a new you know I did try you, some new shoes on that I was wearing here today. I didn't know if they were that that bad my my summer sperries. Well I'm not sure if I look like if I look like casual man about town, or if I look like I look like I'm I'm going to church and I'm six years old, and I should have like a sailor summer hat spirits. with it, my summer spirits. It also sounds like a drink I would probably have if no yeah. one was looking. Yeah, waiter, can I get yeah. a summer spirit. Um, it should be. I'll tell Micah about. He should come up with the oh, summer. Sp- that's a that's a. Oh, and he's in Charlottesville. That drink will go off the shelves. Yeah, it there. really yeah. will. I'd be like, could I have a popped collar? And you know what? Bring yeah, me that summer sperry too. Summer sperry. Um, so, yeah. So, no, the elephant in the room. Our phrase. Our phrase for the day. Our first phrase for the day is the elephant in the room. So Steve, when react, I, react. When I hear that, I think it's one of those idioms that hopefully doesn't have some horrible backstory that we seem to have. You know, maybe there's some ties to colonialism in India, who knows? But when I hear it, I think it's one of those ones that's kind of, it just explains itself. Mm-hmm. The elephant in the room is something so huge and obvious that you have to address. People don't want to address, but mm-hmm. it's a it's a problem. Yep, it is an elephant in the room. Yes. Um, by the way, colonialism in India was like my favorite '80s like new wave band. Could be. Do you remember them? I could see that. Um, they were great. Yeah, I mean, so that is definitely the main thing 
that you think about, and that is what I... That's actually the only thing I thought it was, Mm -hmm. was that there are also other variations. So Elephant in the Room um, was... I, you know, that's one of those ones that, I mean, I was born in 1978 and Mm -hmm. I've always heard that one. And I thought that one was, had gone back forever and it kind of does, but people didn't start using it a lot like we do Mm -hmm. until 1984. There was, um, which a lot of, by the way, 1984, a lot of stuff happened. Like that was a big year. But anyway, um, there was a book that came out, I guess it was a popular like book about recovery or whatever. And it had, Mm -hmm. it, it was called The Elephant in the Room. Um, children dealing with alcoholic parents. Okay. So this did take a dark turn. I'm sorry. Um, which anyway, that one had a little too close to home for me, but it, 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 some of that became a book. You remember back, so back in the eighties, like books, everyone had certain books, like the joy of cooking. Mm -hmm. Everybody's mom had that or dad. Yeah. You know, whoever decided to cook and that that could have been a dad or a mom Mm -hmm. or a kid. Um, but there were a lot of books like that. I mean, The Late Great Planet Earth. I guess that was seventies. But um, you never heard of that one? No, I have. Okay, I think right. that was not. I don't think every family had that. I think. Well, since... no, I know. I'm not. It's not. You're right. It's not the same right. as Joy of Cooking. I guess my point is, eh, it still happens today. But I guess this was one of those books that was popular enough to where yeah. the elephant in the room kind of caught on as a as a thing. Now, did that have anything to do with? Pink elephants. So okay. when I the elephant in the room drinking, right. I'm thinking of, of pink elephants. Yeah, so that's, I'm glad you brought that up because I had actually, I've heard white elephant because I heard of it, you know, done the white elephant Christmas exchange. Right. Um, and and I've heard people say, oh, well, that's the white elephant in the, the room or the pink elephant in the room. And I always thought it was like they were conflating something or they were messing something right. up or they were getting something confused with Dumbo or something, um, which they may have. But pink, so pink elephant has a different meaning. So there are like four meanings uh, to elephant in the room, which is, which, which I didn't know. And right. I love that. I love researching these things. And you go, I've always used this one way. Right. This is what this means. Mm-hmm. And then you go, oh my gosh, somebody else is using this and meaning something totally different. So pink elephant in the room, it kind of refers to hallucinating. Okay. So there's there's a quote again, like back when people. Um, read newspapers mm-hmm. and like magazines. Some, some it was some quote where uh, somebody said something about being hung over and right. seeing a pink elephant in his room. Okay. And the guy's like, what happened to it? And he goes, oh, it slipped through the keyhole, which is just referencing some sort of like hallucination he was having. Yeah. So totally different. You're seeing pink elephants. So I think pink elephants, I think of where I learned most, most things about culture cartoons you know you watch bugs bunny you watch tom and jerry i think of you know that's how i learned most of everything i know about opera involved you know bugs bunny chasing around right. elmer fudd right or getting hammered which was also just always a, a impressive to me the amount of times that in, in children's cartoons uh before someone got hit with an anvil there would be a, right. a lot of drinking yeah and you know falling down with x's over their eyes or tom and jerry partied like they had to. They had to drink through the pain of Man, what they did to each other. Things were rough. And that, that's why every, when we look for origins of anything, it's never like, oh, well, society, everything was going so well in society. We, we decided to create a day called um, Pink Elephant Day. And we all saw, no, it was always something weird like that where it's like, yeah, we had, we had cartoon. I mean, it was simpler times back then. Yeah. And quite frankly, I miss those. But you could never have a cartoon. Well. You'd have it on like Adult Swim. Adult Swim has some messed up cartoons. Yeah, but, but not, still, these just, were for kids. Yeah, but it's still Bugs Bunny cross dressing, drinking, dropping a hammer on somebody or an anvil. Right. Well, every time you say getting hammered, I think you're talking about them getting drunk. But they did that too. Yeah, they, they lit- literally got hammered. Oh in my that gosh! Show. Write that down. Yeah. We need to do a topic. We, we need to do one about drinking, like terms like getting hammered, and uh, you know what? There's probably no actual well you never know if there's an actual origin or not maybe it's tom and jerry because when be. you got hammered in tom and jerry do you get the x's on your eyes so it could be um i forgot what i was gonna say all right um so elephant. i'm so we're so far away okay it's okay so we said uh, pink elephants <laughs> elephants in the room you said something about white elephants where do white elephants come in all, all right so let's we'll back it up a little bit because the first, the first elephant in the room deal, actually, the fir- the farthest back I could find was like in 1814. This guy, um, who is a poet and a fabulist, mm-hmm. which is somebody who writes fables, 
did not know that until. Sound like a rapper I wouldn't listen to. Right. Which could <laughs> yeah. be, frankly, any rapper. But that's L- another. Little fabulous. Yeah. Um, I actually, they, I saw something where they said um, Spotify has registered. I guess if you're an artist, you can like sign up for Spotify, kind of like you know anybody can sign up for a podcast. Like, right. As, as we can, we're going to find out. Um, they said something like there's over two, ten thousand artists that start with a Lil now. So wow. Like you know, because remember there's Lil Bow Wow and Lil John. Lil John, ten thousand Lils. So if you want to be a rapper now, it's almost like who, MC now. Who was the first one then? Lil Bow Wow was a protege of uh, Snoop Dogg, right? Lil Bow Wow. He's was like he forty five now. Had to be the first. I, he was definitely before Lil John. Yeah, he, he yeah. was. He was. But I wonder if he's a, that. Well, he might be the first successful Lil. Oh, that's a first. Lil Orphan Annie, rapper. Yeesh. Think about it. Right tomorrow. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> the Fabulously wealthy. Right. Drove around with exotic animals. Very young. Had a big house. Yeah, big house. She had uh, she had that DJ, DJ Daddy wore bucks on the ones and twos. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Uh, all right. In 1814, this guy Ivan or Ivan Krylov was a poet and a fabulist. Wrote a fable called the Inquisitive Man. So the story is this guy goes to a museum, and he notices all these tiny things in the museum. Mm-hmm. It's like. Oh, check out this little, you know, this egg that's beautiful and da 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 da. But what he but he leaves and he never notices in the middle of the museum elephant. A giant elephant. So to me that's definitively where this came from. Yeah. I mean that's a story about a guy who doesn't notice the elephant in the room. Yeah. Now it elephant doesn't occur. Yeah. So it doesn't pick up steam, but it's there. Now you may have heard of uh, a guy named Fyodor Dostoevsky. Mm-hmm. He wrote a novel called Demons, and in it, at one point, he writes, um, this guy, the Belinsky from Demons, was just like Krylov's Inquisitive Man, who didn't notice the elephant in the room. Mm-hmm. So there you go. That's definitive where it came from. And to me, that's like what it means. This right. other stuff, Pink Elephant. Now, White Elephant, a lot of people attribute, and it, it, it came from, from Mark Twain, um, because he wrote a story called The Stolen White Elephant in 1882. Now, this has a different spin on it. It's something that's too big to miss, yet impossible to find. So, so is Mark Twain who to blame for, for white elephants? He is. So, I, again, I don't and, know the whole... The yeah, I don't know the whole thing, but but the, but it's different in that... Um, so, in the in the story, apparently, it's, it's a uh, like a detective story. And there's a large white elephant imported from Siam, and it disappears while it's quarantined in Jersey City. So, not one of his more famous works. Yeah, frankly. sounds like a bad Quentin Tarantino script. But it sounds it sounds bad. Um, but it's it's Mark Twain. So, so, what is the worst white elephant gift you've received or given? Well, okay, I'll be a little different with this. I mean, I I like white elephant gifts that are. Obviously, that are tacky or funny, right. but I, I, the worst for me is like a bottle of wine or something. Because I mean, people always go, "Ooh, let me get the wine," but I'm like, "Boo, I can buy my own five dollar wine." Right. I want something tacky. Um, how about what about you? Have you ever had a bad one? You've ever, I, I usually well, bring something I, I, I'm generally the one giving the bad gift because that works Good. for my so sense of you humor. You should come to my and I'm cheap. So a couple years ago, I had somehow acquired a a Hooters T shirt. Hooters being the uh, restaurant or somehow acquired. So you woke up one day, and I mean, there was a. Hooters. There's no way I went in there unless I was going to to witness or hand right. out tracks. But somehow yeah, never, I acquired a Hooters T-shirt from the restaurant or restaurant, which is now a, a, a genre of of restaurant. So that's like a restaurant that serves chicken. chicken yes, breasts, yes, or? it focuses on chicken. So right, I uh, brought this to a a white elephant with a a, a a group of couples we used to hang out with. Oh yeah, uh, well, that sounds. Extra creepy now. Yeah, it it was a, a group of conservative, uh-huh. Uh-huh. like-minded uh-huh. people. Like-minded. Like Don't say like-minded because that makes it sound. <laughs> weird it makes it sound <laughs> racist, doesn't it? No. <laughs> a bunch of so it's a bunch of couples set in their ways. Yes. Um, it was our get it, together. It, you it kind was, of like leave the keys um, in no, a bowl. All right. right. So this is gonna go through butchering in post. This was a, a small group. <laughs> I'm a fun. church small group we were in. So oh. I bring it there. And, you know, this is about as raucous as I like to get. Yeah. Of, and I think this is pretty funny. And it is funny until I realize who is going to pick out the white elephant gift. And it was this extremely nice, very sweet young lady who was eight months pregnant. And, you know, like some people Ouch. are 
like, you know, yeah. can be kind of like righteous and good, but in a snotty way. Yeah. She was one of those people that you, I felt bad. I was like, I don't want you to be soiled right. by picking up a Hooter shirt. Right. But wait a minute now. Now you have to, I mean, she had to choose it. Oh, no, somebody gave it to her. No, it's it's wrapped, so she doesn't know what she's okay, getting, but, but I know what it is. Up, but it was still a bad, yeah. It so was, I saw it happening. It, so in your in your mind, you're picturing one of the dudes opening it, and it's, like, hilarious. Yeah. Or, or somebody or else. Or somebody else who it's it's fun. It Maybe she right. wasn't pregnant, but she opened up and yeah. dealt with it very well. Yeah. And, again, this one made it even worse. Was She wasn't, like, somebody that did, like, that kind of who farted look on her face <laughs> right. of just, like, oh. You're that guy. Just yeah. you know, very, try. Oh, that that's funny, and try. Right. So, best white elephant gift I ever gave. Mm-hmm. Took a bag of sand, put a sticker on it that said, "Gluten free pancake mix." <laughs> Wait, that my friend I, is I comedy heard, gold. You've had you've had. I remember you telling me about having actual gluten free pancakes. So that's you were inspired by our life events, right? Yeah. Am I right? It, I do remember And it this. probably was. Yeah. I, yeah. It was probably sixty percent sand. So the next topic is I I've I'm really excited to do this one because I want to hear your reaction. I was with our mutual friend Eric. We're getting ready for a concert. We're gonna go see um, this metal band Ghost that okay. we've now seen twice. Anyway, so we're at a establishment near the house, mm-hmm. um, picking up some beer because we're a bunch of us are gonna ha- get together ahead of time. Mm-hmm. And I look at him and I'm like. Dude, we are loaded for beer right now. And he looked at me and kind of gave me a courtesy laugh. And I'm thinking, I don't think he gets the, the majesty of... That is a solid pun. A solid thank you. And I, I'm the type that I want to get recognized. I, right. I just, just That's I, some solid right. wordplay. And he just was like, yeah. And I said, yeah. I said, so, of course, I'd explain it. Because yeah. if people don't get the joke the first time... Nothing's funnier than explaining the joke. Yeah, if you, you want to really unleash the humor, right. explain a joke to somebody. You know what you're doing? You're teaching them to fish. Because, look, you didn't laugh that time, but yeah. you need to know this was funny. So yeah. if I say something funny... He's again, a better person because of that. So I told him, I said, I was like, yeah, it's like loaded for bear, but beer. Yeah. You know, we got so much beer, we're loaded for beer. And he goes, he's like, have, did you just have a stroke? Like, what are you talking about? So, so of course, what I did was... Because I always have to prove that I'm right. Um, and it didn't occur to me I could just, like, Google it. Right. I, I'm no kidding. In line, I turned to the person behind me. I go, you've heard you've heard about Loaded for Bear, right? And it's like a 22-year-old. Yeah. And she's like, huh? What? Don't talk to me. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I just look at the person behind her who's older, and I say, you've heard of Loaded for Bear? And that person also looked uncomfortable, but yeah. they did confirm uh, yes, loaded for bear is a saying. So then I, I didn't look insane at all. Right. Right. So, um, Steve, please, as somebody much older than me, you heard this phrase. Yeah. Thank and it, it, I think like elephant in the room, it's one of those ones that's very obvious. Bears are nature's terror. And if you're going to go up against a bear, you need to be loaded. You right. need to be ready to do everything. You need the proverbial kitchen sink, which may be future episode. Oh, good call. There for it. So bears, the worst animals ever. And let me tell you, yeah. I don't, okay. I like bears, theoretically. I like to watch bears. I think bears catching salmon are one of my favorite things. There used to be a, I don't remember what park it was. Mm-hmm. No, no, it might have been Yellowstone. Mm-hmm. They had a camera set up so you could just watch bears live. I used to watch it at work all the time. Yeah, that sounds like nightmare feel for me. So let me tell okay. you the root of my, my bear fear. I, I, like you one time, had really nothing against bears. You know, maybe it's the propaganda of mm-hmm. Yogi Bear for mm-hmm. years and years making me think, you know, yeah. he's going to put on a, a collar and a tie. And, but he was smarter than the average yeah, bear. And like it said, picnic, picnic, which picnic. is just fun to say. Right. So many, many, many years ago mm-hmm. on my honeymoon in Banff, Alberta, Canada in the springtime. Ooh, you think you're better than me? You go to Banff. I went to Mexico, so I have I have no problem with Mexico. Okay, you were out in the you were probably safer outside than I was. Well, mm, wait a minute, it was yeah, Mexico. Yeah. We'll get back to that. Right. So they have you know. So I'm at this resort, which was expensive, by the way. Exactly. And I knew it. And um, so it's springtime in Alberta. Mm-hmm. And they have these signs, you know, about bears. And of course, I'm also thinking it's Canada. You know, the world's nicest people. They're, they're going to like right. gently let you, you know, well, just kind of tell you everything. Nice and they're probably Canadian bears. Canadian they're extra bears. nice. Right. So essentially, they made it very clear. Mm-hmm. 
especially in the springtime, that if you come across one of the bears out mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. they didn't say anything like, you know, nice, you know, play dead or keep your distance. Hold on. Let me, can I guess? Yes. Because I do know what you're supposed to do when you see a bear. I believe it's run. If you want to die. If you want to make I'm sure someone sure, eats your I'm face. I'm pretty sure you run. No. Yeah. They told you fast. if you were confronted by bears that the bear is trying to kill you and you need to fight for your life. That's the worst advice I've ever... That is the worst advice I've ever heard. Now, if, let me tell you why. Because you have no chance. You have no chance. You're not going to beat a bear. Right. And that's you, what they're saying. That's so why they made it very clear. So wait a minute. Actually, they, I'm, I'm mad now. So you're telling me that you went to, you paid a lot of money for a resort in Banff with a bunch of Canadians that are supposed to be nice. And what they told you was, if you see a bear, you're going to die. If a bear can, comes at you or confronts you. Did they, did, what does that mean? Eye contact? or If you're in a situation where you and the bear are in each other's personal <laughs> space. They were honest about it. <sighs> of... This is also to, to stay on the trails. Well, not to go like pick a fight with it. Not to go searching. Did through we the learn forest. nothing from from freaking Swayze? You don't fight until it's time to fight. But I guess it's time to fight. When yeah. So this would or, be a time to fight. This yeah. would not be looking for trouble. Okay. Anyway, since then, yeah. I never really realized bears could be that much of an issue, and that right. planted a little bit of fear an acorn yeah. for. I'm joking about it, but tr- actually, that is kind of. That is sobering, right? They, they, they're dead serious. Like, they're like, yeah. if you're in contact with a bear, you're probably going to die. Do what Jeez. you can. And odds are, and they, they made it clear, you, yeah. you weren't coming out of this. Right. So from there, bears. Yeah. Bears. So to, so you're right. So, yeah, you don't want to face, face a bear with a freaking you know, slingshot. Back in the day when you talked about colonials, back when they used muskets, they had to have the, they had to have like the, right. they call it the ball, the wad, and the, and the, um, you know, whatever, the gunpowder. Yeah. Those are all nicknames for Eric, by the way, yeah. if he ever hears this. <laughs> right. And, yeah, so basically, depending on what you were hunting is the sort of um, ammunition and the sort and what you would, what you would load up your gun, your musket with. Um, there's this really great, like, old quote from, like, the, so the, I, I actually do really enjoy that when they, they have the earliest usage they can find, right? So the earliest usage of loaded for bear, I wish I could say this in a um, some sort of old accent, but it's actually, the, this is weird, proceedings from the Grand Commandary of Knights Templar. Friggin' Knights Templar. Like, Dan Brown needs to write about this, but... Um, in 1877 and it's like sir cruft thinks we do sir thomas injustice as he doesn't as he as he don't mean what he we you know what i can't even read this <clears throat> the point is they're talking about some sir cruft which is great um did sir thomas an injustice because he shot his bull on mm-hmm. his property wow. and they're like we can't help it we were loaded for bear and we aimed at a bear if a bull was at the, with, if a bull was within range and was hit we are sorry for the bull but can't stop hunting bear Right. So they're like, look, we're bear hunters. We're loaded for bear. If one of your bulls gets hit, you know, sorry. The we're Catholic gonna... Church has in, has right is has supports my view of bears exactly. And th- this is this is a, a big a big moment for me now. Just to see that yeah. they've known for a long time. The Mother Church has been aware of bears and how evil they are, and yeah. maybe that's why the Knights Templar were formed. One of the great things about Origin of Species has been the opportunity for me. I'm kind of a kind of a reclusive, stay-at-home sort of guy, but it's given me a chance to meet some new people. For example, Lauren Bingo Knowles. She uh, is a good friend of the show and occasionally will join us for an episode. We've also made uh, great friends with Alan in Australia. Alan often will email us to point out how we're murdering the pronunciation of a word. Alan also taught me that murder in Australian means clearly and accurately articulating. Did not know that. But the most interesting person that we've met is Robert Banquette. Two summers ago, before the vid ruined everything, Scott and I met Robert when he was visiting in town. Uh, He was up from Montgomery, Alabama at a comic book convention here in the Richmond area. We had a chance to speak with him, a very interesting, very charismatic person. Uh, Robert had a great idea for a history-themed podcast, so we were able to work with him to help him realize uh, his dream. Robert is from an old-money family in Montgomery, 
and his family apparently has been well-connected for a very, very long time. His show, True Facts with Robert Banquet, shares the stories behind the stories about many important historical figures. Oddly, every one of these historical figures uh, that Robert brings up somehow is related to him. And even more bizarrely, each one of these historical figures encounter a distant relative of Robert's nemesis and archenemy, a man by the name of T. Hollis Mellencamp. Even though Robert's podcast is mostly about history, animals from time to time uh, do make an appearance. From the first episode of True Facts with Robert Banquet, which reveals the true facts from the life of Arthur Wellesley, who most people know better as the first Duke of Wellington, here is Robert Banquet sharing some true facts about tigers. Before we proceed on this portion of Arthur Wells's life, we must first discuss some tiger facts. Tigers, or Panthera tigri, are the largest members of the cat family, rivaled only by the lion, or Panthera leo, in strength and ferocity. The tiger usually hunts by night and preys on a variety of animals, but it prefers fairly large prey, such as deer and wild pigs. A special liking for porcupines, however, is an exception. True fact, tigers are privately owned by many prominent citizens in our country, including Taylor Swift, Ralph Nader, Paul Rudd, Michael P.S. Hayes, Chelsea Clinton, George Clinton, Louis Farrakhan, Honey Boo Boo and Mama June, Peter Bogdanovich, Matthew Broderick, Nicholas Sparks, Willie Nelson, Lonnie Anderson, and Beta O'Rourke. Gonna be honest with you, not a huge fan of horses. First, you normally don't eat them, and if you do, it's not a good situation. So the fact that you normally don't eat horses, immediately two strikes against them. But one good thing about horses, they generate a lot of good idioms. So many that I've already done two episodes based entirely around words and phrases about horses, and I'm potentially considering a third one. I gotta have my horse trilogy. The first horse-themed episode we had was episode 35. In this episode, Scott and I talk about a lot of fun things. We talk about my cherished millennial, who actually is a real person named Mason. We talk about John Hey Haywood, who comes up in some other shows. And also, we end up talking a lot about Little House on the Prairie. And if you're going to talk about that show, you're going to talk about Michael Landon and his glorious hair. Uh, which, by the way, Scott makes a comment about the Highway to Heaven hair being garbage. Gotta disagree. Uh, Michael Landon's hair in any circumstances is pretty good. Um, and of course, me being me, I do find a way to talk about bears. So for our final segment uh, from episode 35, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, hold your horses and horse feathers. Horse idioms. Horse idioms. And this is a Steve researched episode. So Steve, so, you know, take us away. Be- Full of facts and, and plenty of ums and mouth pauses as I overthink things. So uh, to start off with horse idioms, we're not going to do this one, but yeah. there's a little bit of a Trojan horse because I did want to use an excuse to talk about animals. Mm-hmm. we got to talk about bears yes. because it's springtime. Bears are coming out of hibernation. Yeah, People aren't prepared and new listeners might not be aware of how much I'm always on the lookout for bears and yeah. I tried to take all of my, my fear and my family's fear and compare it to, you know, if you're going through something, well, is a bear involved? Right. What what should you really be scared of? Which everyone should is bears. So it's springtime. They're coming out of hibernation. I'm concerned um, my wife and daughter will be traveling to North Carolina for spring break here shortly. Is that bear country or? Yeah. So they're, oh, okay. at, they're out in the mountains in western North Carolina. So they have to deal with bears, strong potential of Sasquatches. 
Yeah. They'll have to deal with people from North Carolina. So there's a lot of <laughs> lot of things they need to be worried about, but a bunch of jacked up bears coming out of hibernation, you know, probably yeah. Going through Mountain Dew withdrawal. So. I was about to say those North Carolina bears are doing the do. You know they are. <laughs> They're doing the do. Yeah, and what and in what else is coming out? I mean, raccoons are are raccoons kind of year round though, man. I they don't care. So. They're but they're gonna show up anywhere. If you but. avoid garbage and avoid being out late, yeah, you're okay. Well, but anyway, just a yeah. reminder before we start talking about horses, which they're not bears and they're not alligators. Well, that's what I was going to say, though. Let's talk about this because horses. You were this was your your idea. You were right. you were definitely uh, hot to trot for uh, the horse talk, which is not one we we're going to do. Nope. But so the impetus uh, was actually I had a, a conversation recently with a millennial who's I'd call him a cherished millennial. He was a millennial that that steered me in the direction of my current barber. Okay. So he's he can't be he, all bad. He bring he actually does literally eat goldfish. In front of other people, and I've told him not to do that, and oh, he no. doesn't care. But he doesn't have a juice box. But anyway, oh, good millennial. I mean, he's my cherished millennial. So we were talking about something recently, and I actually said to him, "Well, I don't want to look a gift horse in the mouth." Right. And he actually said, "What does that mean?" Oh. God. And I, I took a moment of pause because I know what I know what it means. Essentially, don't be un- ungrateful or right. don't take you know take for granted something you've been given. Right, right. But it intrigued me yeah. to the roots of it. So first one I want to look at is, is don't look a gift horse in the mouth. So is that a phrase you use? Absolutely, yeah. Use it. One of the ones like your your cherished millennial. I didn't know what it meant for the longest time. I've never, I've done no research on this. And I think one day thinking about it, I go, oh, oh, okay. So if somebody gives you a horse, you don't inspect it sort of like if somebody gives you a, a new car and you're like, hold, hold on, hold on. Let's, let's go, th- go through and make sure everything's working. It's like, this was a gift. Just take right. it. And ma- but, but so I do use it. No clue as yeah. to the origins. So you, you've hit on kind of what it gets at there. So I think one of the key things is it's a gift. You're not paying for it. Yeah. So you really don't have the right to inspect things. Right. Um, and you know, looking a gift horse in the mouth, what you would do if, when you got a horse, you know, someone said, Hey, here's a two year old horse for you. Right. You'd look at the teeth to see, the oh, gum, so that's the why it's recession. the teeth. Yeah. So it's also, uh, okay. you, you would look at the teeth to see where, how the gums have receded. Got it. Um, and what's also the expression long the tooth. Oh, Related comes okay. from that. So, yeah, because see, I would have thought more, don't look a gift horse in the hoof or something. You you know what I mean? Like, where right. where would this come from? But so that is something that, and horses do have big old teeth. Yeah. So and you Someone can might have lot. tried to look. At the hoof, but that also could have ended with someone not having any more teeth in their own mouth. Yeah, after true. they've done that, too. right? Because you can always give a little, like a little sugar or an apple or carrot. All things I've never done because I'm kind of scared of horses. Right, uh, but certainly you can't go down, go downstairs checking out the hoof unless you know what you're doing. But either way, you don't want to do any of that. Yeah. So one of the things, so th- this phrase is something we all seem to use. It's kind of obvious once you hear, you know, the reason why people say it. Um, so it's not that, but. We're not stopping there. That okay. what I liked about this was looking up the, the origin of it and just some of the the journey that the phrase took nice. uh, to get here. I found it very exciting. Take us on a journey, Steve. So prepare to take a, a journey with me. The phrase first appears in English in 1546 as "Don't look a given horse in the mouth" mm-hmm. um, by a gentleman named John Haywood. Now, have you ever heard of John Haywood? I don't before? think so. Okay, good. He is. Uh, somebody that I, I've discovered through this and, and quite an intriguing person. So Is he going to be like a big hitter, you think? Or I'm, I'm, I don't want to oversell it. Mm-hmm. We're talking Guy Fieri big. Oh my, so you, your, your life is going to be different. To I know. So to give you an example of what he is, um, how big he is, the, this phrase um, appeared in English first time, 1546, as don't look a given horse in the mouth. Right. In his book entitled, a dialogue containing the number and effect of all the proverbs in the English tongue. That's out of bounds. That is a very, <laughs> very unedited long time. It's a mouthful. And it's also spelled in the old English way that it looks like, um, right. like you know, when your kids start trying to spell big words for the first time, right. and they, they look like they've just newly immigrated to America and right. have been drinking. That's what it kind of looks like. <laughs> Which so, probably happened a lot. Yeah. So um, 
that's one phrase that he's given credit for. And where okay. he got that from, it, it's speculated that he obtained the phrase from the Latin text of uh, St. Jerome's translation of the letter to the Ephesians, okay. which was made circa AD 400, mm. which contains the following text. Noli, Ique, Dentes, and Spesere Donate, Michael Francis Rizzi, do you renounce Satan and all his works? <laughs> Trying to get my, still don't have my Latin priest voice down, but um, in... It's a, it's a much, it's an improvement from the last one for sure. I'm, I'm getting there. It was more robot than than old Chinese man, which is, was last time. <laughs> um, the term that I've butchered in Latin is actually never inspect, inspect the teeth of a given horse. And so, so this was from the Ephi- from Ephesians. The letter, uh, St. Jerome's translation of the letter to the Ephesians okay. that he did around, uh, around AD 400. Um, I don't know where I was able to find. I don't think that's from Ephesians. Oh, I, I guess gotcha. it's like his prologue. Oh, of, his... Uh, Okay, it's like his notes or his... Yeah, or when he sent it to St. Whomever was there. So uh, back to John Haywood. Yeah. Who, again, his his book, a dialogue containing the number and effect of all the proverbs in the English tongue. Wow. Is a very long title. Talked about Alanis Morissette earlier. That sounds like one of her... Yeah. Was it her that had the... No, I'm thinking uh, Fiona Apple. You're thinking of Fiona the, Apple, but, but yeah. Alanis had one too. Supposed former infatuation junkie, which is hard to say, but then... Um, yeah. Fiona had when the pawn breaks. Yeah, it's like dot and dot, it's, dot dot. Exactly, yeah. it's just when the pawn, but it's about yeah. a million different other words. John Haywood was um, active at the court of both Henry the Eighth as a singer and player of the virginals, which is what they called the mm-hmm. the types of songs he did. And it was a master of acting boy group of singers, um, and also uh, worked under Mary the First. So he was Catholic, but even when Elizabeth became Queen, he was still around. I, I think you know, in modern days, the the tension between Catholics and Protestants mm. is uh, not as intense as it was back then. When right. It was probably the highest point where people were were losing heads sure. over that. So he, he did, you know, he was able to kind of work with both both groups there. But many other phrases that I was surprised. And I think later down the road we might actually have to have a John Haywood episode. Okay. So yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some at you that he's done. I'm uh, excited. Summer winners. Yeah. Some some are losers. That is not a phrase um, that he did. <laughs> so, haste makes waste. Winner. Hold on. I thought Ben Franklin came up with that. Um, in 1546. Wow. Haste maketh waste, actually, was his, his version of okay. it. So, Ben Franklin improved yeah. on it. Two heads are better than one. What? Mm-hmm. That's a good one. All's well that ends well. Nice. Okay. Which, those are some of the winners. I know that's a winner. I could I could sit here and read lists. No, that's real. Those night. are those are really good ones. Those yeah. are ones that we all yeah. they, they they've lasted throughout the years sort of like uh as you alluded to earlier, out of bounds and and uh boy, what are some of the other fiery ones I forgot? But basically yeah. I'm I'm disproving my point here, but some that um maybe aren't as good in my opinion. Okay. When he should get aught each finger is a thumb. Oh my! The fat is in the fire. Hmm. Love me, love my dog. <laughs> Which sounds like it sounds like a sitcom. I wouldn't want to. It watch. sounds like a lost Spice Girls song. Yeah, That's but crazy. again, a lot of other phrases. And I am holding back on things that we have because he's. Yeah. No, I got to hit you with a couple more. Please. Rome wasn't built in a day. Well, that's a good one. Yeah, John Haywood. Wow, he is a big hitter. So wait, he did. So he the more the merrier. I have John not Hayward. heard of. Have not heard of that. One. Yeah, you've never heard the more the merrier. I'm just kidding. No. Okay, especially when you're we're out larping. Yeah. So, John Haywood, don't look at gift horse in the mouth. Yeah. Uh, probably started with Saint Jerome. Okay. Uh, John Haywood used it in 1546. Love it. He worked for Catholics and Protestants and had his head attached to his body and also made beggars should be no choosers. Really? Yeah. John Haywood. So good job for him. So yeah. uh, to conclude this idiom, I want to hit a, it's something that uh, is kind of out there in the ether, a lot in the vernacular, very popular. Mm-hmm. Other countries actually use this. So in German, I can't say that. Germany and Yeah. 
I got to work on my German accent. I don't have that. But in Spanish, yeah. I think I can say it in my Telemundo voice. Please. <clears throat> e caballo. Regla do. Nope. Not even close. <laughs> what was that? I have a good Telemundo voice. That wasn't it. No, so, it, you know what it did? It, was, no, it did was, sound like the Telemundo, like when they're saying the next show that's going to come up. But that's what I'm trying to get. But no, I got to say, oh, Telemundo. There we go. E caballo. Regla do. No sila miran los tenentes del mundo. There we go. I got yeah, you it. Got, you got it I got the bass end. You got it um, it's also in German, which I can't do. And it's also, there's one in Welsh, which I will just show you how it's spelled. Yeah. A lot which, of weird. Uh... Where it starts with the C. It looks like someone had a stroke. Holy Is cow. Right? Yeah. And maybe they were. Yeah, I just had and a I, seizure. Yeah. yeah. And I went, if my Welsh hating friend was here, I wish he would be. Able to oh, know. he'd have some smack to talk about yeah. that. So look at don't look at gift horse in the mouth, which is is good. I like it. Good stuff. Okay, so the best part of that was we found John John John, John Haywood. Yeah. yeah, I mean, wow! I can't believe he hasn't come up yet. I I wonder if he spent his spare time going to to different diners. He in, yeah. in the sixth well sixteenth century. They, you know, when you said um, Guy Fieri, I'm thinking, well, it's a tall order there, buddy. But there yeah. are some similarities. You know, he was an entertainer. He a lot of people probably didn't like him because he was, you know, very uh, Catholic in a time where it was hard to be Catholic, depending yeah. on who you were around, just like a lot of people have hate for Guy. So, all right, man, I hope we get more. And let me just say, John Haywood, right? John Haywood. Okay. Every time I hear the last name Haywood, I think of a Saturday Night Live sketch. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the one where they just did a cold open? And I or I don't know if it was cold open or it was just a sketch. <laughs> The graduation one, where they're reading all the names, and it's like every name is a double entendre. So I'll let you, I'll let you figure out what yeah. Haywood. Uh, let's just say his last name. Actually, I'll just say his last name was Jablomi. Uh, so that's pretty. Can't can't hear Haywood without hearing. <laughs> so for some reason, I kept thinking of Fred Rerun Barry. Oh, okay. when I would hear that, and I just looked up why, and I was honestly like, "Why yeah. am I thinking of re?" Now, first of all, I generally think of Fred rerun Barry. Yeah. And I, when we're, we're, <laughs> he's chambered. When we're, yeah, when we're doing idioms, he's yeah. always back there. But yeah, uh, dynamite, right? Uh, no, his, I'm kidding. I know that's not. That's okay. Um, but his friend, but there was an actor on the show, Haywood Nelson, who played Dwayne Nelson. Oh, Dwayne was Dwayne the one that did? Uh, hey, hey, hey. That is him. Okay, yeah. there you go. Well, good. Well, we've gone That's from a... we've gone from John Haywood to hey, hey, hey. Yeah. All right. Wow. Um, um, I think I liked your Telemundo voice better. Do hey, hey, hey. <laughs> no, it's gonna sound like. Yeah. All right. Cool. So. All right. Uh, mo- moving on. Moving on. So um, the next one is is hold your horses. Yes, hold your horses. Hold your horses. Now the first thing I think of, and if I'm stepping on anything you're going into, let me know. But. This is one of the PETA unfriendly ones. Do you remember that? You're not supposed oh, to say know. hold your horses. What were you supposed to say and say? Oh, oh I, something dumb. I, I don't remember. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, because it wasn't, to me, it wasn't the most annoying one, but it was the most um, yeah. That's tough like, when you're unnecessary one. No, because it was like, they're all unnecessary, but I can understand if you don't want to kill two birds with a stone. But as soon as I heard it, I remember myself saying, what's wrong with holding horses? <laughs> There's nothing yeah. wrong. So... We're going to find out the actual origin of holding, hold your horses. Hold your horses. Mm-hmm. So this is one that, that I use, and I almost I think of this more of almost like a mom one. Like yes. I can hear my mom. I can hear like everybody's mom. Like the word bucko should get tacked onto yeah. the end. Yeah. And kind of in that, that shenanigans sort of way. Yes. You know, hold your horses, mister. Yeah, mister something, bucko. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so going back, it, it, there's... It was speculated that it came from from the Iliad, um, but I went back and someone else had, had done a good job of uh, taking the section and reviewing uh, the different translations that have gone through. Okay. Um, so looking back at, at other authors who have translated it, it's come out as "Stay your horses, hold, stay your steeds, stop, check thy steeds." Ooh, I like that one. Rain your coursers in. Which I like because I like that sounds, one too. That sounds a little dirty. Yeah. And well, drop, so does stop. Check your steed. It sounds like a 1980s like hit by what was it like relax, don't do it. It'd be like stop, check your steed <laughs> before you do it. There you go. Could be right. Well, <laughs> if Frankie goes to Hollywood, he's a comeback. Yeah. You might have given it. You might be the seed from which a mighty 
homosexual oak will grow. God, I hope so. Um, so initially, I thought this was cool because it went back to the Iliad. Apparently, right. it does not. not even though I'm still going to prepare or pretend that it does. Yeah. Um, however, the roots of it are still kind of exciting because it comes back to America. So okay, cool. It, it seems that the uh, the origin of this goes back to the United States, um, or originating as hold your hosses. Ooh. Which I didn't say very well. Because I think Well hoss like uh hoss. From, there yeah, we go. Hoss. You gotta put some bass on. I said hold your hosses. <laughs> hold your hosses. Yeah, you say it like a sassy southern yeah. bell. You hold your hosses. But God, I'm not going with you to that ball. You hold your hosses. <laughs> Oh, Beauregard, yes. He's back. Beauregard, hold, hold no. your horses. That Gosh, sounds better. I've been waiting for De La Mundo. I've been waiting for Bogar, Beauregard to make a comeback. Yeah. So, uh hold on now. Hold hold, hold your horses there. Yeah. Bucko. Uh hold your horses. Are they Hosses. spelling it so is it actually a different word or is that just a Well, as as dialectical? horses were referred to often just as Haas. Okay. So that, that came up a lot and there's multiple multiple uses of, of this. So what was the before you get into that, I need we need to just acknowledge real quick when you talk about Haas, I mm-hmm. mean, did you what was it Gunsmoke? What was the one on the Ponderosa? Um I'm let's see. Bonanza. Bonanza. Haas and Little Joe. Did you watch that show? I did. Yeah. Because I would cartoons would end and I was too lazy. This is when you had to like get up and change the channel. I oh, would yeah. pretty much watch whatever came on. Well, so. in fairness, there was like two channels, but you were going to get... First of all, that's how I got into Little House was same thing. Cartoons right. are over. Little House is on. And the... Oh, the music. The Oh, yes. I'm putting I'm putting a clip of the music in mm-hmm. to the beginning of Little House. You'll get swept away. It's good. Oh, yeah, it's so get good. S- swept away at that show. Because Michael Landon's hair yeah. is glorious. Yeah. It's Cause, unbelievable. Because he went from Little Joe to at some point, oh. like, I'm going to have... I mean, I don't even know what you'd call that hair. I mean, it, it's magnificent, but it's not It's not like 80s kind of puffed up. No, I can picture it. I don't know. I'm speechless, actually, because yeah. I don't know how to describe but, it. But honestly, and it, maybe that's how he got Highway to Heaven. Maybe it's angelic. I mean, well, his hair is... It's something to behold. I, I see how you skipped right over Little House there, because we, we somehow just talked about two Michael... Well, now three Michael Landon shows. Yeah. Michael Landon, was there a more wholesome dude? It, well, other than like Mr. Rogers right. or Bob Ross, nothing ever came out bad about him. He was he was a great guy. And he just had that face, like that Pa Ingalls smile, where he's kind of like, the right. lips are kind of pursed while he's smiling, and you just feel all warm inside. And then you got to say, what is it? Gentlemen, hold your steed or whatever. Yeah. But... I, I like I miss I miss Michael Landon man. Well, he was he was married three times, so maybe there's wow man two, two women that might disagree with. Well, it's her. probably not his fault. I don't see yeah, there's no probably way jealous his... of his hair. Yeah, that's Th- what that's it was. tough to compete with that. There's not there's not enough conditioner. Yeah. To, to make your hair well, look high, as good as his. The highway to heaven hair was trash. The the Ponderosa hair was the you know the more I think about it, it's almost like a if you took a male doll like a. But not even like a Ken doll. It just doesn't seem real. It seems very fake. But so anyway, you were talking about Where were how we? you well somehow we, went from we got the onto, to, to um, oh Michael. Hoss. Well, Hoss. you brought up Hoss, and okay. Hoss was hold your yeah. hosses. So that was a, a U.S. slang for horse, and it shows up uh, multiple times uh, when it's used. So one of the um, first uses that really got it into the general vernacular. Um, was a play by David Humphreys called The Yankee in England. It came out in 1814. Okay. And um, I, David Humphreys is not another John Haywood. No. So, sorry if I, I've built that up. No, he's more um, of a, just a one and done. So very, like he goes to Hollywood. So, well, I don't know if you one and done with that song. If you ever listen to it again, you don't want to say that. But... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, Stop, hold Yank, your steed. Yank, Yankee in England yes. um, was pretty inf- influential. Um, the stage character of the Yankee um, was a prominent character, apparently, right. in, in comedies back in that time. Well, there sounds... was the, and you maybe you're about to talk about this, the um, Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, mm-hmm. which I, I'm sure was subsequent to this. Yeah. But. 
So the traditional use of it, or the more familiar phrase, um, we see comes in 1939 in a, I would hope that this was from the publishers of London Magazine, Ladies Magazine, Mm -hmm. I think what was another one, New England Magazine. Yeah, London, you said London Magazine, right? Yeah, and this one's a little bit better named. It's uh, Chantelaine, but it was a Canadian ladies magazine. Okay, so this one, it actually had a, more, I mean, I don't know what a Chantelaine is, but... It's not called Canadian Lady right. Magazine. So they've gotten to the point of people decided, right. you know, let's not name the magazine to who we're trying to market right? or to whom. People, Let's just pause for a minute. People didn't know how to name stuff because there's all these ones that are just London, Women's Magazine. Then you had, um, who is the circus guy? An autobiography written by himself or whatever right. the redundant one. But now that I think about it, we did bring up Fiona Apple earlier. So Yeah. But in, in all seriousness, the reason they probably did that was now you go to the store. Yeah. There's multiple ladies' magazines. Yeah. Back then, it probably was ladies' magazine. Absolutely. You didn't have a choice. That's the magazine you're, you're taking it right. home. Well, just like when, you know, back in the day, man, Ron Burgundy, you, you just watched the news. It right. was the news. Now you got, yeah, everything to choose from. I miss, I miss the old Ron Burgundy days, but... Yeah. Okay. So hold your horses. Starts with thought it started in the Iliad. Right. Disappoints you that it doesn't. No. But our moms use it. It comes back to America. It gave us a chance to, to use the the word hoss. Yeah. Which I think would be a good one. It's not one of the, it's not up there with cut of your jib or loaded for bear and things I want to bring back. Right. But you get called hoss. No, hoss is a good one. I like it a lot. Yeah. That's something you can call. I feel like it got beat out by calling people chief or things like that, but hoss is a good one to throw out there. Call yeah. somebody hoss, especially a big boy, big guy, or the ironic small guy, or the small guy you ironically call hoss. Yeah. All right, good stuff. So, last horse-themed one. Yes. And I wasn't sure. There's a lot of horse-themed idioms out there. Right. And if anyone wants to request ones that we've missed, you would need to have more time more time spent doing other things. Yeah. Um, but so uh, to conclude, the last one I'm going to use is horse feathers. Yeah. So I was interested because I, I didn't, I mean, I, I've heard of horse feathers, right. but only with the, the Marx brothers. Yeah. So, but I don't yeah. know of it being used idiomatically. So looking forward to hearing about it. So that. this is, this is one that I don't use that often. I've heard it. I want to say I've used it in, situations and you can relate to this as a father that when you your children show up you will find certain words yes. coming out of your mouth and you right. will bend it yes into other words yeah. and i'm fairly certain that watching football games or driving in traffic or right. seeing someone uh buy kale at a store that i've wanted to shout profanity <laughs> and maybe horse right. feathers is something that's a good one that's come up to it it's kind of like the the christmas story yeah Fudge. It is, and and related to that, some people think that horse feathers is kind of a use, um, a, a cleaner way to say horse. Uh, horse oh, oh, da- like horse poo poo. Yes, okay. poo poo. Keeping with our our, <laughs> our dad theme here, we actually said poo poo multiple yes. times. Yeah. So um, this, uh, so horse feathers basically is another way to say okay. I can see that. Yeah. And it, it, even as you were, because I was racking my brain here going, I don't know why you would use it. And I and I just sort of in my head was going, oh, horse feathers. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's what it is. You don't want to say, yeah. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's also with the, it's kind of like a nonsense sort of. I remember. It's another uh, way to say nonsense or. Yeah. I remember we had a, a basketball coach back in uh, middle school, mm-hmm. high school. And he would often kind of make things up to because he wanted to swear. He knew he did. Right. Which, by the way, that's been my go-to lately. Uh, I don't know where you are with what you call. Like, I used to call them cuss words. Mm-hmm. And then cussing. I start saying cuss because, I don't know, there's something kind of that felt, I don't know, as, you know, Reagan explained what a pleb was. It just felt like cuss is just something you say, like a country thing or something. Yeah. So I started saying... Um, it's not as cultured. Swear is kind of my go-to now for that. Mm-hmm. There's other ones you can say. But do you have a preferred uh, profanity? You can say profanity, but that's not a verb. I'm trying to think of where we're still in that stage. We we don't want to make certain words forbidden fruit, especially right. words that my kid 
has heard a hundred times as I've driven around the car. Well, that's true too. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, less about me, more about where this came from. So there is someone else that came up that I was surprised that is, I don't want to throw around Guy Fieri, um, but this person, cause yeah. I don't, I don't like some of the other art that this person did. And we'll get okay. into that more. So, so uh, a comic strip artist by the name of Billy DeBeck. Okay. Um, was popular in the twenties, um, is actually responsible for several other, uh, kind of catchphrases and, and, and idioms mm-hmm. that came out of it. Um, and I'll get back to those in a second, but he's also responsible for one of my least favorite Sunday newspaper cartoon strips, Snuffy Smith. Snuffy Smith. Yeah. Gosh, I don't know anything about He's, Snuffy Smith. If you saw a picture, I thought you were going to say of, Kathy. No. Ack. Um, <laughs> at least they gave us that. Um, right. That's another one. Actually, that's another one. You know, there's just all right. So I, I imagine people don't do this anymore. But when you were a kid, you got yeah. a Sunday paper, and yeah. you, there were the comic strips you liked. You like Garfield. You like Peanuts. Garfield, Peanuts. Um, eventually, Far Side. But. Yeah. But then there was just the ones that I didn't understand were there. Kathy. Well, Kathy now at least I can see there's something for it but there was like Rex Morgan MD oh, that, that is tragic and like that one Prince just Valiant. well yeah those were but the, the, those um, were in a different category and they were they were like soap opera e but then they were what was the one that was like I don't know like uh, a sergeant or a private it was uh, some military oh, Beetle Bailey Beetle Bailey yeah not I don't, I don't remember it being very funny. Uh, so yeah, and, but, but I think where you're going to was, this is back when the competition maybe wasn't the same, uh, n- not to say I'm sure it was competitive to get into, um, a syndication as a, as a comic strip, yeah. uh, artist, but you, you weren't competing with all the other forms of entertainment. So you could get away with a, a few years of subpar Beetle Bailey. Right. And then there's that one, um, it's like horrible because the guy's always beating his wife. It's like an Irish guy. Oh, I remember that one. Oh my gosh, go back or don't. But like there was an article I want to say in like AV Club or somewhere where it was like, how did this survive for so long? And all, the guy's an alcoholic that just comes home drunk and beats his wife. Like that's the joke. Like that's the punchline. Right. Um, I'm going to pretend I remember what the name is and I'm not yeah. going to say it because I don't want to, but I actually don't remember what we'll, it's called. So, we'll be all right. so anyway, so this was a comic strip so, guy. He, right. So he, he uh, originated a comic strip called Barney Google and Snuffy Smith. And Barney, good Lord. Barney Google was the original character that kind of dominated it, but it was eventually phased out. And then Snuffy Smith took over. So Barney Google was uh, Barney. a rich, kind of a rich guy with a top hat, chomped on a cigar. Think. Think the the Monopoly guy, yeah, kind of like that. Okay. And Snuffy Smith was some hillbilly that he ran into at some point. Yeah. And um, I'm not throwing out the term hillbilly. The guy was presented as a hillbilly. Right. As, so you know, Snuffy would cuss, and then Barney would swear. Yeah, is what you're saying. That's a that's actually a very good point. Thank um, you. So again, one of those comic strips that I j- still don't see uh, the point of. Right. But that is actually as much garbage as I've just talked about that, it still runs. It, is it still, still pre- runs. It still presently wow. runs. So it, it started in June 17th, 1919, and still continues to run. So How is that possible? I have to, no idea how this works. I will that, say. I mean, that's a good gig. Well, like, I'm, I'm bashing this, but good for that guy. I'm, I'm not going to do it, you know, 90 years from now. Maybe we will. Maybe we'll be on the moon somewhere yeah. with our half robot bodies still talking about stuff. Quick quick sidebar on, on old comics that we can keep or not. I'm actually just genuinely curious mm-hmm. on what your take what your take on peanuts is. Because there's a very I, wide range of takes on okay. peanuts. I am a huge peanuts fan. Good. Like my my kid has gotten into would do like I used to do and go to the library and get the books. Yeah. And, oh yeah, the big. Mm-hmm. But what's amazing about them is the the level that it's written at, yeah. is the vocabulary, and it's not very it's not very direct. Abstract, some, maybe abstract. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Abstract's the word I'm looking for. It is it it is not. Yeah, I it's think written if for you... kids, but it, it's not written to, to talk down to kids. Like you will be more intelligent after reading that. There's right. a lot of abstract thought that you have to put into things to connect what what's going on in those. Totally agree, and I think if you don't like peanuts. Because it's like you don't think it's funny enough or you don't think it's like witty or smart. It's like you don't get it. 
It's yeah. actually pretty funny, yeah. and it is subtle and abstract. Um, and some of that gets lost. I think a lot of people now just know them through like uh, the Christmas specials or Halloween specials or things like right. that. But if, if you get a chance to read the, yeah. the comic strips, yep. they're they're tremendous. Big big peanuts guy. And um, if you haven't seen, and I'm like you, I grew up uh, reading the the book, the big books collections, um, and um, I love those. But a recommendation, if you haven't seen, is listen is watch the. Snoopy, the one where Snoopy's brothers come visit, it's freaking hilarious. I don't remember what it's with. It's like Snoopy. It's not Snoopy come home. I think it is. It, okay, maybe it is Snoopy yeah, come home. I've seen it, it. It's oh, it's so good. He goes and visit like so. His brothers. He's got the one. He's got Spike. Spike is the one that's got like the the droopy uh, whiskers, and then he gets fat in like two days because uh, I don't remember which one it is. Not peppermint patty, but one of them. Lucy, I think, feeds him. Just mm-hmm. feeds him and feeds him. Um, anyway, so just wanted to, we can separate peanuts from some of these other yeah. trash comics. So again, Billy DeBeck, who I, for some reason, really don't, I didn't realize how much I didn't like Snuffy Smith until I saw his other accomplishments yeah. and still didn't do it for me. So he is credited with uh, the first actual use of horse feathers. And here's some other phrases he's gotten into the um, vernacular. Mm-hmm. Heebie-jeebies. Ooh. hotsy totsy, mm-hmm. Balls of fire. Times a wasting, touched in the head, and bodacious. Okay, so, I'm taking that all in because that's such a it's a good range of stuff. It's, range it's of, not Haywood esque, but it's that's pretty good. And again, it is pretty good. The fact that something he started in what 1917 is still running. So balls of fire, and then that one yeah. had Jerry Lee Lewis co opted that one, I guess. And awesome, um, my uncle did, but that was had something to do with a trip to the Philippines. <laughs> Um, oh. So to to conclude, can't talk about horses without you and I, as, as anyone who's ever listened to this, are obviously very rugged, very outdoorsy. Yeah. Um, you know, look like the brawny guy sort of people. Have you ever ridden a horse before? No. I'm not a guy that rides horses, just like I don't ski. There's things well, I don't do. That's because we are raised in the streets. That's <laughs> It is. And, and, and once you get to a certain point in your life, you just don't. Yeah. I probably should turn over a new leaf, but... No, I, I'm we're, not gonna, we're, we're too old. Just like, just like we had, we talked about, we've talked about our, like how we should never build anything together <laughs> and, uh, our moving mishaps. Yeah. No. The two of us riding horses is, is one of the worst ideas. So I actually, ever. the first time I, it's interesting bringing up skiing. The first time I ever rode a horse was also the first time I skied. Oh, you did this all in one trip? It did. Are I, you I, okay? Were there bears involved? Was this when yes. you were in Canada? I, yeah. Oh my gosh. So there's a lot. You, the fact that you survived this trip is. I know. I, I ran basically all the outdoor adventure in my life <laughs> into into a few days there. Oh, good for you! So I just nothing, laid around in Cancun. So. Nothing like on your honeymoon to be emasculated by being terrified of bears, Dude. going face first in the snow, and Lord knows what I look like on back of that horse. You did, you did your equivalent of like a Bond film. You were there. You were like on skis, dodging bears, and then and then had to like jump onto a horse. Yeah. That's well, amazing. The one thing I took away from riding a horse is if that horse didn't want you on him, yeah, you, I'm not stopping. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now, the horse is not gonna want me on it. So that's a given. He would be he would book me off for sure. So as we come away from this, always be aware of bears. Well, that's our show for this week. If you have any suggestions for topics for our show, or maybe if you just want to let Scott know how much you miss him, leave us a message on our voicemail. You can uh, find our voicemail at 804-621-5803. Leave us a message, and you could very well end up on our show. Thank you very much for listening to Origin of Species. Watch out for bears, and kale is from the devil.